Welcome to the Boss It Weekly podcast. A no-nonsense, no-hype, frank, and close-up analysis of what is currently working and what is not in the world of software. The Boss It podcast is packed with major takeaways for software business owners and managers. So, let's begin. Hello, my name is Mark Edwards, and this is the Boss It podcast. Something a little bit different today. I'm always trying to uh, think of other things that I can bring to the Bossit audience. Is we've talked to a number of different uh, software entrepreneurs. We've spoken to some providers in areas of marketing and sales. We've talked about some technologies. Today we're going to talk a bit about the healthcare sector. Uh, and this is on a wide world basis. We'll, we're going to be talking about technology. We're going to be talking about customers, the NHS, how the market is evolving. And to do that, I was thinking about, I know quite a few people in this area, who would be the best person to speak about it and really be able to sort of give us a feel and a bit of an insight. And today I've got Steve Whiteman. He is sales director for Servelect. So he's sales director in the healthcare sector, but I've known Steve for quite some time. Um, Steve was head of sales at 6PM PLC, which was a Maltese organization that we ended up selling to IDOX uh, PLC. He's been in the healthcare sector for quite some time. And I think he's got some interesting stories to tell about that. So Steve, welcome to Bossit. Yes, nice to meet you this morning, Mark. It's a long time since we've spoken, actually. It is, yes. And we, we, we were having a bit of a chat before we we started the recording and we're trying to remember how we first met. I think it was through an introduction and it was related to document management. I remember us meeting in a hotel. Yeah, it was probably. a Marriott Hotel in Leicester. Oh, well yeah, remembered. Uh, well remembered. I didn't, I... At least 10 years ago. Yeah, it must be. It must be, absolutely. I was really interested because 6 p.m. at that at that time, they, they were actually relatively small. But what really impressed me was, first of all, you had a focus in the healthcare sector. I think that you were looking at a couple of other sectors as well and had a little bit of business in some other areas, but it seemed to be mainly around the healthcare sector. And it was the degree of innovation that you were talking about at that time. You had some really exciting development plans. And I know that um, it wasn't quite a year, but it was a number of months. And when we met up again, one of the things that I'm always looking for is, you know, how have the plans worked out? I know that you had plans at that time to to launch these new products. And I, and I remember I asked you about it and I was expecting to get the typical answer was, well, we didn't quite reach that launch date. That's been pushed back and this hasn't happened because that's typical. But you said, oh, yes, we've done that. And actually, we've got a couple of sales there. And we're now doing this. That really impressed me. And that's the thing from that those first couple of meetings that stuck in my head. How did 6PM manage that? Yeah, it was interesting because I think at the time we were at a bit of a crossroads in, in healthcare where we'd been providing. One of the things we'd been providing was um, was enterprise document management. And we'd already done a couple of big deployments of document management. We're talking, you know, 8,000 users into one hospital. Yep. And we had quite quickly realised in doing the deployments as well that, that they would struggle to maintain this type of system. And, and the business case, actually, for more hospitals doing this was quite poor because, essentially, unless they had a, a strong e-form strategy to get rid of the paper... And then actually what they were creating is even more cost with not a lot more benefit by just scanning in the medical records because they'd scan in a record for clinic, but that wasn't the end of it. Because they were still filling things out on paper, they just continued scanning more and more and more. And we could see it wasn't really going to deliver the benefits at the levels that, that trusts were looking for. So I think when we met at the time, we'd just finished a process of looking at how do we deal with this paper problem and, and how do we manage the paper better whilst we do this transition over, over a five or six or seven year period of putting in systems that stop the need for paper to be created in the first place and stopping it at source? Well, I think that that was that was the other real strength that I saw in your organisation at that stage, which I'd like to speak 
speak about a bit more in a minute. But but why do you think that that you were able to move so quickly as an organisation? Well, I think we were. I think our whole business was based around an agile DSDM philosophy, and that you can often deliver eighty percent of the benefit with 20% of the effort. So we would get very good at focusing in what was the real problem we were trying to solve. And and what we see quite often is people build systems, and I've seen it for years, particularly in healthcare. People build a system, it looks fantastic. And at best, they've built it and they understand the problem they're trying to solve, but actually there's not really a business case for doing it. It almost is, becomes a nice to have. And at worst... People build it, and then it's a solution looking for a problem. They don't even know what the problem is they're addressing with it. You mentioned DSDM, Dynamic Systems Development yeah. Method. Do you, it, just explain briefly what that is for people who may not, well, we, may not we, know. Basically, we prioritise. This is about prioritising the benefits we're going to deliver and then mapping them down to function points. So we don't try and deliver 100% of the benefit with the first release and, and, and take and take 12 months to do it. A good example of that is if you look at the way people have run data warehousing projects in the past in healthcare, yes. where we've got, customer might have 100 different dashboards or reports they want, ranging from daily operational reports through to weekly reports, monthly reports, quarterlies, and statutory returns at the end of the year. Yes. But what they do is they build all this and then they go live and they've got everything built. Whereas with an agile method, you say, well, actually, we'll build it. And when we get ready, the the daily reports ready to go live, we'll go live with those first because we could have those up and running in three or four months. And now I've pulled forward uh, uh, six months or seven months of benefit of those whilst we then work on the monthly reports, then the quarters, and finally we do the annual ones. So we break it out that way. And what that also does is you're showing the customer something very early. So it's constant and frequent feedback then. Yeah, you're getting that feedback loop and yes. working on the premise. If we're going to fail, let's fail fast with yeah. it. And then readjust our sales and go in, the diff- in a different direction if we need to. That's really interesting. And I, I really did see that. I mean, I, I I see them myself as being in a fortunate position because I learn a lot from from meeting companies, and sometimes I might be meeting four or five software development companies a week, and have some really interesting conversations. But when I think back to those early meetings, I was six pm wasn't a big company, but there were things that were sticking in my mind and in really impressing me. And the second thing that I thought really stood out and, and was actually shown to be very true later on was the fact that you you really understood your customer and you were there looking to solve the problems before the customer even realized it was a problem. That really impressed me. I, 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 want, to, I want to give just one example of that, perhaps before you talk a bit more about that, was during our engagement process with 6pm we needed to get to understand your solutions but also get some feedback from clients and you took us in and we met with very senior consultant and a number of different hospitals and one of them said to me I've, I've been a doctor for 20 years and the solutions that have been given to me have been appalling at best he said 6pm was the first one that allowed me to do a better job that's really stuck in my head and he said it was because they listen and they work with us in putting together that solution that was very very impressive feedback yeah i i, I found the same thing and it and it, it it never ceased to amaze me with, with the solution we, we did around the the tracking stuff even after the, the the solution went live in 10 or 15 sites and operations directors used to come and tell us within a week you know that this was transformational in in terms of what it did for them and and the bottom line is you know we weren't clever people or we're not clever people what we did well though is is listening to what their real problems were and engaging them in designing what the solution should look like but keep it focused all the function points that we were going to put in had to map back to delivering one of those benefits 
if it didn't make a direct contribution to those benefits, it didn't go in the it didn't go in the system. We left it. It was a nice to have. Yes. And, um, and that was a really that was a really interesting process. I think I think the one clever thing we did do is we realised with that particular solution that an acute hospital is a big big logistical operation within the four walls with things moving around and being delivered to places. And um, but it didn't use any of the best practices of logistics and distribution companies. And they got the best processes in the world when it comes to putting things on shelves and moving things around and tracking them. Um, you know, they're better than anybody. So what we did is is really take off best practice from other industries and applied it to, the, to, an, to a healthcare setting. Yes. Yeah, smart thing to do. You're absolutely right. Logistics companies have been doing it for a long time and they're talking about, you know, millions and millions of of deliveries and products they have to be very very efficient at that so uh, learning learning from another industry is great you know everybody said well, well we've got a case notes tracking system but what happened is they said yes and the medical record staff used to use case notes tracking really effectively but what happens is when they deliver a trolley full of 50 records to a clinic for patients turning up that day they're expecting the receptionist or somebody within that clinic to go into the system find every individual record from patient and say, that record's now with me. And what happens is they don't have the time for doing it. It's not a practical way of them doing it. So in effect, the process broke the minute it left medical records. And if you look at a logistics uh, uh, company, when the lorry turns up at the next depot for delivery, they don't go in and scan every parcel in that lorry they check the lorry in to the depot and in the lorry they know every item that's in it and in the system they automatically transfer every parcel to the next location yes and that's all we did so we would deliver a trolley full of records to the clinic with a with a trolley id on it with a barcode id we would zap that barcode id and we would zap the new location id and then in the system 50 records have now just moved you know, and that's that's gone from being a an hour or an hour and a half job for for um, for a receptionist to being a ten second job. Yes. And, and and so the process now works with it. And when we then started to apply new barcode standards, like the new GS one barcode standards, then everything became that much more easier to do because all the barcodes were standardised. Yes, absolutely. I mean, before we go into any more detail around some of the solutions that, that you've been involved with in, 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 in implementing and getting out there into the healthcare sector, let, let's talk a little bit about the healthcare sector itself. Because um, prior to meeting you and 6pm, we had been looking within the software technology sector, uh, what we talk about as being the hot sectors or what we're aiming for is to be focused in on a particular vertical before it becomes hot. We're trying to predict, a bit like having a game of football, you want to get there before the ball arrives. And we believed that although there were frustrations with many suppliers into the health organisations, inevitably, with increasing uh, population, with an ageing population, which would be consequently, there would be more diseases that the health organisations would have to be dealing with. And that's, that's worldwide. And budgets that didn't look like they were going to be increasing at the same rate, it meant that there had to be significant improvements around efficiency. And most health organisations had probably been slow to adopt much of the new technology, especially around software. So we felt that there there would come a time, almost like a dam bust, and I was thinking of the NHS in particular, where they're sort of holding back because they saw any implementation of any big software solutions. There were some, there were some high profile fails, real some really big failures out there. So they, there was a resistance, but I think eventually, with those dynamics coming together, that dam would bust would burst. And what we've seen, you know, going back to when we first met, is that acquisitions in the software tech all around health have increased, 
and for a number of years, acquisitions in the healthcare technology sector have been the highest of any vertical. So we were sort of writing about this and trying to predict it, and fortunately on this occasion we were right. So when I when we well, I got the introduction with 6pm, I was quite keen to meet with you guys. I was keen to to meet with other companies supplying into the healthcare sector in whatever part of the world. What what have you seen sort of gen the general trends within healthcare? Because I think you know you've been working in this sector for a long time. You are a specialist. I think you must be immensely patient, <laughs> yeah, just because there are frustrations. At times, yeah. yeah, and I've I've had a lot of organisations that have said to me, you know, I don't want to deal with the NHS. Uh, I don't want to go into healthcare. It's so bureaucratic. It's so slow. We're going to focus elsewhere. But what you you give me your perspective on the healthcare sector it, as a whole? It's interesting because you, you you make a few really good points there. I mean, if you look at the healthcare the healthcare 10 years ago when we were really just kicking off in about 2008 and we were in the right the austerity was kicking off um I, I think what really got us to the table was that people had to start trying to get more service delivered for the same amount of money or, or actually saving money I, I mean i swear to this day if we hadn't have had the government pushing for those better measures and stuff that I think people would have just carried on as they were. You know, the solutions we put together for uh, for the logistics stuff was was largely based around barcoding. Yes, yes, it had some latest technology around RFID, but to be honest, eighty percent of the benefit was delivered around barcoding processes, and that's technology that could have been put in twenty years ago. To be oh, honest. absolutely, yes, easily. Uh, so. I think what was important at that time, and it's, this is still important today, is that we were creating solutions that had real, genuine cash-releasing savings. And it's also then was about the process we took people through because we didn't do lots of demos and things. We did a feasibility study first, which took, walked around their processes with them. And as we walked around and see and to see how they did things, they said, well, in a new system, this is how you will do it. And these are the savings that you'll be able to make. And they would sign up. So the feasibility study was a joint effort, really. And interesting, out of out of all the sites we did feasibility studies for, which, which you know, ran into the dozens, um, there wasn't one customer that didn't ultimately buy the solution because the cash releasing savings were so good and the ROI was, was, was within 12 months. And actually not one customer even had a demo of it. So often the customers approach these things the wrong, wrong way around. You know, they often, we go and see them and the first thing they want to do is go on a reference visit. And we would challenge them on that and say, well, what's the point? All you're going to go and do is ask if they lose this system and ask if you like it or not and what you think of the company. And that, that's probably about all they can ask at that stage because they don't know anything more about where we're saying they're going to make the savings. So we used to say to people, let's do the study first, then you can go on a reference visit and then you can ask some very pointed questions yes. at, the, at that site as to whether you made savings in certain areas and how effective was it to know whether you're really signing up to something you're going to deliver on or not. How often, uh, uh, speak honestly here, I know it's a podcast, but I, I think how often were you dealing with people that were making a decision about something that they didn't really understand? They didn't know enough to ask the right questions. Um, not, not very often. Because oh, okay. what we did do is move away from, we moved to the business, we moved and dealt with the people that had got the real problem. Often, I think in, in, in the software industry, we end up, we're trying to deal with the IT director or the CIO all the time. And whilst they're very important people, they're not the people that own the problem. They're, they're, they're right. just another, this is just another project on their list. Yes. And whilst they absolutely understand the technology and how we do it, they won't understand the problem at the business level. So we, we would deal right down. We were working with everybody from, from the admin people on the ground that actually did this every day. Yes. Right up the chain in the business, you know, to the chief operating officer and then obviously the finance director when we're trying to rat ratify whether those, those savings can really be cash releasing. And then we're bringing IT into play at the right time in the process. So but I'm assuming that's down to your management 
I mean, you're yeah. you're not going to be approached typically by the person who who is actually involved in that process. Who's who's right at the coal face? You're going to be approached by somebody else within the organisation that probably doesn't necessarily. So you must be managing this and 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 getting those conversations set up. Yeah, we we were managing that, and 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 to be honest, you know, the great <clears throat> thing with the NHS and working with the NHS for me is that that 95% of the people you meet in the NHS are in there because they want to make a difference. Mm. And, and okay, very occasionally you do meet people that actually just think they've got the best process in the world and nobody could possibly do it any better. And uh, I, I did have one of those particularly at one hospital. And, uh, and the first meeting was over in about 20 minutes. And, <laughs> and, and actually that person, that person retired then and we went back and they actually went from business case to to starting their implement, sign off and starting their implementation in six weeks, wow. and that was a that was a a million pound plus contract because we got to the right people then, and particularly in this instance, the deputy FD saw the value in the solution straight away. And actually, there was an article in the press recently, and and actually, the chief exec of the hospital thinks the savings they made ultimately have been many multiples of what we suggested they were going to get to start with. Mm. And um, that's a really interesting space, and I know why people understand about the inertia, yes. the, the, the 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 bureaucratic nature. It's not really. I don't find it's too bureaucratic. You know, you've got to understand when they're signing off these deals. It might have to go through two or three committees and ultimately to the board, and that's the process, and you have to follow it, and you have to build that in to your plan. I think where people get frustrated sometimes is, though, it goes to the board, and whilst you think this is the biggest thing and should be top of their list of things to do, people often forget that, you know, these these hospitals, you know, particularly in the acute space, are often seven, eight, nine hundred million pound operations. Yes, and, and our solution is is whilst is important, you know, often they have many other things that, that jump the queue. Yeah, and, uh, you have to just accept that. You know, they're trying to run hugely complex organisations, and we're not always going to be top of their list. What about the what about the tendering process? Because this is something else that I hear, and quite often I think. Uh, some of these comments are coming from organisations that maybe just have dabbled in the healthcare or are thinking that they've got a solution that's applicable, but are very tentative of going in there because they've got these perceptions of slow, you know, lack of inertia, tendering processes that just suck up your time. And what's what's been your experience with tendering? I agree, and that's ironically that's one of the reasons I always thought I'd stay away from the public sector. I mean, <laughs> To find myself in this space, having spent most of my career in the early years in, in the likes of insurance and telecoms markets, because um, um, I feared all the tendering process. But what we found w- with the NHS now is they're increasingly getting very pragmatic. So if you show them something that A, has got a very good payback, and yes. B, you know, has got a level of uniqueness to yes. it, we found most procurement directors were increasingly quite pragmatic because there is a cost to them to going out to tender, not least a cost that if I'm showing some, a system that's going to save them fifty or sixty thousand pounds a month, and they're going to take three months to go through a tendering process, that's quite a chunk of benefit they've now forfeited. Yes. Um, and what we found is ninety um, percent of the. Um, uh, customers actually bought as a direct award straight off the frameworks right? Um, and, and the, the latest frameworks all cater for direct awards and my advice to anybody would be to work with one of the big framework um, vendors like somebody like a Softcat who really understand how these frameworks work and what you can do and can't do you know we were never experts in the frameworks we were never going to try and be on the frameworks directly when we can work with the people like Softcat to 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 do it to do it with them and acquire that expertise, and um, and the other ten percent only went out to mini tender, and the mini tender process was less than two weeks. Oh, okay. I think so, that's quite different to the perception that many people will have. 
Yeah, but if you but then a lot of people are trying to sell commodity products. If you're trying to sell, yes, let's say your EPR, for instance, you haven't got anything really differentiating you particularly from the next EPR vendor. No. So they have a duty to go and find out if they're getting the best value and they're choosing the right one. Um, so I think it's a I think it's about picking the fights you feel you can win. Yes. Yeah, yes, that makes sense. I mean, for somebody who didn't want to go into the public sector, now as sales director for Servalec in the healthcare sector, um, you're pretty committed, really, aren't you? (laughs) Yeah, well, actually, once I was in and you started to work with a lot of these people and started to understand the difference that you could make by doing things better. Yes. um, you start to get your own passion for it then as well, because, you know, we're all we're all taxpayers. We all love the NHS. We yes. all use the NHS at some point in, in our in our lives. I mean, I, I've had, you know, one of my kids has gone through emergency treatment in the NHS, I've had an emergency treatment, middle of the night, in theatre. Yes. And, you know, you come out the other side and you think, wow, you know, that was quite something else to, to, to take your your child to a small, a relatively small acute hospital at 12.30 and at 1.30 they're in theatre with a full surgical team and, and being operated on and fixed. And that's when you get a real passion, I think a real passion for it. Yes. And um, I think all too often we find in the press a bit that, you know, they want to report on the, you know, the one in 100,000 things that's not gone so well. Yes. And they ignore the other... The other ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine things that have gone really well. Yeah, they want to. They want the the head the headlines that's going to make people sit up and take notice. But I, I think that there there's my experience is that there are lots of exciting things happening within healthcare. And I know when when we have had conversations in the past, I can hear in your voice that you're passionate about some of the things that are happening there and very optimistic. I mean, let's talk a little bit about some of those those changes, some things that are happening already. What about remote health care? Because this is a definite direction that, that's happening throughout the world, is that you, you, people, you, you want to get people in front of specialists in that particular field, but that can be difficult when you've got a very diverse population. I mean, the UK is not, not a massive country, but there are... You know they're going to be consultants at different locations, and and there is a big move now to be able to bring the healthcare to where the person is. I mean, this also has particular implications when you're talking about elderly people who perhaps aren't that mobile, or, or perhaps people that are disabled in some way. There are lots it's of things happening in this area. Yeah, yeah, we, we've we've seen we've seen quite a lot of this, and obviously you hear in the news all the time about you know, doctors and clinicians starting to use Skype for consultations and stuff. And, and yes, that technology, it does have its place. But as usual, I think people plough into this a bit without understanding what's the real issue we're going to address. Yes. So, you know, I was with a GP um, only a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this. And, and we came up with, the, you know, he said that they're being forced to try and use Skype um, uh, for consultations with their patients. And but actually, it's not going to deliver any value. It's going to actually exasperate the situation because the seven minutes or whatever the figure is that's readily that's widely accepted as the the minimum time you need to see a patient to do anything constructive. Um, seven minutes is seven minutes, whether I'm mm. on a Skype video call or I'm on a uh, I'm on a um, face to face call. The problem is, I think though given the pressures they've got and they've not got enough slots to see everybody as quickly as they want already, by making that bit more convenient for the patient, it's actually going to exasperate the situation. It's going to, uh, and you're going to get more patients now. I haven't even got to travel down to the doctors and think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll ring the doctor, see what he thinks. And it's very convenient and it's just going to, it's just going to make the situation worse. But the use of that technology in the right place where you are talking about maybe seeing a specialist consultants that aren't nearby and and being able to consult with them absolutely it's got its it's got its place uh, and with regards to clinicians going out to seeing patients we're doing a lot in that space at the moment with mobile apps and mm-hmm. and it's interesting because 
we talk about the difference between mobilizing the worker and mobilizing the application, right? So it's all very well as taking some forms out of our EPR application and putting them on a mobile and saying to the, 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 the visiting nurse, off you go then. What's that really saved? That saved them not filling out a paper form and then maybe coming in and typing it back into the system at the other end or scanning it in, or whatever they decide to do. That's made some savings and there is some benefit with that. But if you mobilise the worker and put everything on that um, that mobile that mobile uh, device that stops the, that, that negates the need for the clinician to ever come back to the office, then you're really transforming things because now we're talking about saving an hour a day straight away of just travel time coming back to base because what we've put on there is we've put all their scheduling systems on. They're all optimised for um, uh, through route planners. Yes. So we've got an optimised route planning on it. We've got automated mileage tracking so their expenses are done automatically. We've got then automated time sheeting. So all those things that pull them back to base to do, they don't have to do now. So we've got one customer as rolled out to uh, quite a number of users and with with those users off um and it's about 250 users they've created an extra 100,000 appointment slots a year now yes. that's going to make that makes a massive impact then yes but we're focusing on the problem the problem was not filling in the piece of paper and an administrator put it in the problem was the fact that we're spending half an hour travelling each way to and from the base back to the base and then to get the next appointment schedules of course, when they come back to base, it's not half an hour because they spend another half an hour, an hour, bumping into people, talking about other things, and so you're perhaps losing two hours a day in reality. Yes. Whereas now, they jump in the cars in the morning, their schedule's on their phone, and off they go. And it's just feeding them all the time, the the, the, the new appointments. And if they're late on an appointment as well, of course. So my 9.30 appointment's not been finished until 10 o'clock because the traffic's been bad what they can do is then automatically notify the patients that you're running half an hour late, but you are going to be coming to see them. And that will reduce your DNA rates when patients think you've forgotten and then just go out. Yes. I, I think you mentioned about apps, and I think that there's massive opportunities there. We, we have a population that is used to dealing or, or, or engaging with apps on a mobile phone, they have their phones with them. Most people have a, a, a you know a smartphone with them. I think that there's there's opportunities to revolutionise healthcare through apps, in what may seem quite uh, simple ways, but have a really big knock on effect, which was part of the what you were, you were just talking about there, and 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 a couple of those things that that have occurred to me, and, and one of them we we've spoken about many times in the past. First of all, access to to clinicians is becoming more difficult. Uh, to get to speak to a GP, to get to see to a GP is really difficult. When people are phoning in to try and make an appointment, more of that is being done online. But it's exasperated when a patient gets to meet a doctor and it's it's wrong because they're meeting the wrong person or yeah. they haven't got the data to be able to do a, enough of an analysis there there's an opportunity that you can have a sort of a qualification process gathering information uh, to make sure that you are meeting the clinician and he's got all of the information available and that that is the right meeting and i think yeah i agree <clears throat> I, I spoke to i did speak to um uh, this particular gp about that and we were talking about the use of apps and using them in the right way with the patients yes. so you take a patient that's just gone on blood pressure tablets, you know, and we, we all know your blood pressure might spike sometimes. And, and what happens at the moment is if a patient's of, of, of that sort of nature, the minute their blood pressure spikes, they ring up the GP, I need an emergency appointment. And then they go in and then the, the GP and then has to ask them questions about how it's been going, how are they feeling and so on, and then make a judgment there and then base it on very little data. But if a patient was capturing the details of their readings on a little app um, each day and being quite diligent about it, 
we could say to the patient, look, if your blood pressure spikes, don't worry about it. An alert will come up in the surgery. We'll get the GP to look at it. It'll take them 30 seconds to look at the trend. And then either we will call you and, and give you an appointment or we will notify you that, that no action required at this stage. And if you do then take an appointment, first, when you do come in, now we've got all that rich data, the GP can look at all of your readings over the last month and then make a much more informed decision and not ask to ask you a load of questions to try and get to that decision point. Yes, yes, that, that information has been gathered prior to that, that decision has already been made. But you're leading quite nicely, really, into where we are today as a, as a market. I, I looked at a product, oh, it must have been five or six years ago. Um, uh, I think it had come out of Oxford University. And basically, you could look into, you switch the app on, and you could look into the, in, in the, to the camera on your phone, and it, it would basically bleep. And then it's through a thermal image off your, fo- off your picture. Yes. It would tell you your blood oxygen level, it would tell you your heart rate, it would tell you, um, uh, oh, I forget what else it was, there was a couple of other things. And the next version was actually going to be able to tell you your, your blood pressure as well, which was amazing. Um, but as it stood, as an app on its own, it was a gimmick. And the, the, the discussion we were having with them, if you're prepared to spend the money to integrate that, to flow that data into our telehealth system that we had at the time. And we had about 16,000 people on a, on a telehealth uh, service in, in Malta. Um, then it has huge value. Mm-hmm. But if you're not prepared to do that and interoperate with other, other vendors, then actually you might as well just put it up in the app store and sell it for one ninety nine because nobody else is really going to get any value from it because all the data is just sitting on there and it's not collecting and stuff and um but like i said that was a few years ago now and the market now i think is entirely about your your ability to interoperate and give trust and the flexibility to to take best in breed applications knowing that they will interoperate with everything else they've got around them yes it's sort of a complete system i was i was thinking about and this is one of the things that we've discussed before is when a patient's seen a doctor and they've been given medication, or maybe they've been given exercises, physiotherapy to go away and do. A lot of the, when they, when they have the next meeting with the doctor, the doctor is dependent on what that patient tells the doctor. So yeah. if the doctor says to them, have you done your exercises? Have you take your medication? I think many patients perhaps will like to give the, the ideal answer when perhaps they haven't yeah and that can that that can give misleading data upon which the doctor is then deciding the next step whereas if you have an app that reminds the person even shows them the exercises reminds them that they need to take the medication and the person has to click it doesn't guarantee but i think it greatly increases the chance that the treatment is being followed and it also then gives the opportunity for collecting mass amounts of data that you, you can be more confident is more reliable, which will further improve treatment in the future. That could have an enormous consequence. Yeah, and, and I, think the thing is, I think the thing is you can't manage all patients in the same way all the time. And True. What I mean by that is I, I was looking at... Um, uh, doing some work on a business case for an app around appointment management and for a private health company that had lots of visiting nurses, right? Yes. And the, the thing they were really addressing was that they had a call centre that was making 10,000 calls a week to their patients, confirming appointments, making sure they were still going to be in and so on. So they wanted to do an app to to actually notify the patients of everything through the app and they could manage the whole process themselves as a patient and they collected a lot of that data and stuff on the app. And then somebody said in this workshop um, we were doing when we'd, we'd finalised, and it was, ah, but what about the very elderly, you know, maybe the over 80s, we'll, we'll call them, that perhaps haven't got a smartphone. What are we going to do with them? It's not going to work for them, is it? And, um, and uh, I remember sitting there with her and said, yes, it's not going to work for them. 
but we don't not do it for the other 99% it will work for. Yes. Right? What we do is we manage those elderly people in a different way. Right? Yes. Now you call centre can speak to them and spend the time often on the phone that they want to spend talking to somebody because it's yes. one of the challenges they'll ring up and this, is, this might be the only call some people get in the, in the week. And they want to talk for 15 minutes when the call centre wants to try and get it done in two minutes. Yes. So now your call centre will have time to spend quality time with those people doing it the way they've always been used to doing it, whilst we drive out the efficiencies with the ones that do want to do it that way. So we shouldn't be forcing people down one route or another necessarily. And coming back to your point there, You've got patients coming in. You've got you've got three patients, all with that same condition, all with that app. Two of them are using it really effectively. That's great. We can deliver their consultation faster. And then the one that's not comfortable with using it or won't use it, now we've got a bit more time to spend with them anyway. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think that that's using the apps for aftercare. I think there's also an opportunity for preventative. Yeah. I went to I went to the gym this morning, started to exercise, and I got a twinge in my shoulder. Now, uh, it's not serious enough. I'm not going to go and see a physiotherapist at the moment. I'm not going to see a doctor. Fortunately, you know, I've been, I've, I've been doing exercise and sport for a long time, so I know what to do. But for somebody who gets that sort of injury, who could aggravate it, or they want to know how to treat it, so they never need to seek that medical advice. Again, apps with a proper clinical process where you can say, you know, this is the this is what I've got. What should I be doing? And it's recommending, you know, maybe anti-inflammatory ice, you know, elevation, compression um, and so on. That could help to prevent even even in areas of mental health, maybe where you get these apps that are helping people to to relax and, and providing advice. I know that there are websites now that are starting to do that. I think sometimes it's difficult to find the right information and to know that that is genuine. One of the worst things I think you can do is have a pain somewhere and go and try and self-diagnose. But if there were properly um, authentic or proper apps that with a, with a true clinical process there from a reliable source, that would be very valuable to health organisations. I think from a, you know, from a software vendor side, um, I personally try to stay clear of those of that space because now you're turning those apps into being clinical, clinical devices and making clinical decisions, and you know that brings in a whole different range of testing and kite mark standards. And I think yes. from, a, from a software supply side, we try to stay away from it. I remember we, we did do a solution um, a few years ago for hyperacute stroke units, and it was a, a tablet-based app. Yes. And, um, and it was only really, it was supposed to be a data capture app um, when we started out. Yes, um, I remember. And we resisted and resisted going in for, for doing scoring and making decisions. And in the end, that's where we did end up. <laughs> and there was a whole load more testing we had to do then to certify the application. Yes. Um, but what was really interesting in that app, a really interesting point about passion and you know, it's important you get the passion into your developers and they understand the environment they're delivering into. Yes. This is just about reading specs. It's about understanding how does it really operate. So in that particular instance, we, um, we made the developers go and spend um, three days in a hyperacute stroke unit working alongside the clinicians, watching everything they did. And... And what did they learn from that? Well, first of all, they learned the understanding that the importance of treatment by an assessment when you've had a stroke, mm. because if you've got an ability to thrombolize a patient, uh, I think they said was in within 45 minutes, a, a patient with the worst possible symptoms and side effects of a stroke could actually walk out of hospital two hours later with virtually no side effects. Mm. So the, the benefit to the patient's massive and the saving to the NHS is huge. So that importance of speed of assessment told them this app had to be very, very, very intuitive. They didn't have time to start going through different menu systems to find out where to store something if they were, if they were a new consultant just joining the business. 
or, or the hospital. So very much like a mobile app, you had to be very, very intuitive and obvious what they needed to do. So that was the first point they got from it. The second point they got really from the environment, when they followed the process, the, the patient the, it comes off out of the ambulance in A&E, the stroke consultants are there ready to start doing their assessments. And whilst they're doing those, the patient is wheeled up to the stroke unit. But the stroke unit was on the seventh floor. So the first thing we had to do is go into a lift with no Wi-Fi signal. So that then also told them this needed to be a thick client application with very, with very um, complex um, uh, synchronization. Syn- syncing, yep. yes. So it allowed them to carry on treating because those two minutes in the lift, if you're trying to treat somebody in 45 minutes to thrombolize them, that was a big chunk of time in it. We even sat down where there was lists of values. We had an eight-hour workshop where there was lists of values, and we went through the exact wording of each one to make sure there was no ambiguity as to which option they took. Yes. And um, and that's what I mean. The, the, the developers went there, and the developers really understood the impact that they could make to the patients by doing this well. And that's when you start to get the passion in from the developers as well, and they start thinking more laterally. Well, what happens if we did it this way for them then? Would that save some time? Rather than just coding almost power fashion from a spec. Mm. It's bringing the reality of what they're doing very much into their consciousness. That's yeah. a great way of doing it. I love that idea. Just finally, as we sort of bring, bring our conversation to a close, um, 5G increased bandwidth means that there's going to be more options. Uh, I'm aware that there's been a, a number of experiments where doctors have been able to operate on a patient and not even be in the same country. So to get a top expert, because with that bandwidth, they've been able to get the sort of the robotic arms to actually move like very, in a very, very natural way because of that bandwidth. Are you starting to see the healthcare become more open to the introduction of some of these you know more cutting edge technologies i'm i'm sure there are and there will always there there will always be be some organizations out there that want to look at the cutting edge stuff um i have to say it's not where my passion is Uh, my passion is for getting the basics right first and when you look at the way we still operate with the number of patients you look at the number of lost appointments you know in an acute yes. hospital in a in a in a, a month and and it's you know they're typically running at 10 or 12 percent uh, well that's a hell of a lot of appointments if you're running a thousand appointments a day through your clinics and looking at how do you use mobile apps then to to reduce those dnas and address the real problem because it's not it's not the problem of them not being aware of the appointment, it's simply that they, when they can't make the appointment, they're finding it almost impossible to get through to the right people in the hospital. So let's enable them to do it through the apps. And then you look at even some of the most basic of things of being able to find medical devices when you need them and, and treat them. Then I just think there are so many more basic things we need to fix. You know, we should always be looking at the leading edge stuff. That's why IT takes us where it takes us. You know, if these people didn't push the boundaries forwards, we'd be still running on, you know, imperial typewriters. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's not an area that we really look at, I, I have to say. We we keep appraised of it because we've got an interest in it in our yes. business. But we're trying to do stuff right now. And you, you take bed management, for instance. Nobody is really, really cracked the problem of bed management to be really effective with a bed management solution what they've ended up doing is bolting on lots of other things that are actually nothing to do with the bed management but they're all very legitimate things like e-observations systems and stuff like that so we've set out our stall to really understand what we need to do to drive patient flow through the beds and, and be the best on the market at managing the bed and there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to be looked at in that, and now what's happening, what's become really interesting, is more and more we're getting approached now to CCG and an ICS level where they're saying quite rightly we want to see what the state of our beds are across our entire estate, from uh, acute through to community mental health care homes, hospices, 
with a view that if we if we're suffering pressures in one place, people queuing up in A and E, and we've got patients in the acute that could be stepped down to the community and there's beds available, then let's do it. Uh, and again, it comes back to what we discussed earlier, Mark. It's about the data, having the right data collected and then being able to use it in the right way is, is where I think the the future is. And yes, there'll always be some great there'll be some great innovations coming through. There's some there is some incredibly intelligent people, far more intelligent than me, me doing this stuff. And I tend to wait till till a bit later, till it's tested and tried and you know, then we'll look at how we can apply it. It sounds like a, a, a smart strategy. It, you know, it, it, I think what you're saying there is that there's sort of, there's a lot of improvement that can be made at a more fundamental level. And, yeah. and a lot of that involves being able to automate and collect data upon which you can make further decisions. And there's so much improvement that needs to be made there. You know, there's always going to be the leading edge stuff, but so much benefit can be found from just improving the way that the the health organisations work currently, which uh, sounds very, very sensible. Yeah. So it's an industry you expect to be in for quite some time, yeah. Well, until I retire. I hope that's not too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> and are you still involved with rugby? Do you get to time yes, there? Yes, yes, I'm still doing the, the, the rugby coaching. And, and I think actually it's interesting because the way you're taught to coach at most sports, I assume football is the same these days, really does help you in, in, in the way you deal with people when you're trying to get to the nub of these problems because, you know, we don't just tell them, you're doing this wrong, so do this now. In coaching, you, you, you work with the players and understand how do you think we can, imp- what's going wrong, how do you think we can improve it? And it's exactly the same principles as... Is, is working with these clinicians. That's interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I understand what you're saying. Just draw some parallels. Well, that was a great um, podcast, Steve. Have you have you done podcasts before? Um, I don't think I've done any before. I've done something similar, but it's yes. not been published as a podcast. Um, but, yeah, it's um, it's nice to catch up. That's yes. It's been, it's been, like I say, it must have been over a year now. I don't know where the time goes. No, it's like that when you got your head down and then you suddenly you look around and you think, oh, wow, I haven't spoken to Steve for a long time. But I'm, I'm glad I reached out to you. It's, it's been a great podcast. And I think there'll be a lot of people there that it will have provided some, some insight and definitely some interesting conversation. And, and it was like I described, it's just two guys having a conversation. The difference is we didn't have a beer this time, just a coffee and a tea. <laughs> yeah. But I've enjoyed it. So thank you very much for coming on. This was the Bossic Podcast. My name is Mark Edwards. If you liked what you heard, then please pass it on, share it, like it, and give us some feedback. That would be great. Thank you very much. Bye.